Hello folks and welcome to the screencast on human reproduction. Now undoubtedly you've studied this before, probably in middle school as it's part of your curriculum there. But since this is human anatomy and physiology class, it's going to be important to look back at this, at this system of the body and perhaps learn a little bit more about how it works. So here we go. First of all, in a nutshell, it works like this. Remember the process in biology that you learned about meiosis. This is the formation of gametes in all organisms that reproduce sexually. Gametes, otherwise known as sperm from the male or egg from the female, go through a process where they reduce the number of chromosomes in humans from 46 down to 23. In other words, from a diploid number of chromosomes down to a haploid number. Also, what happened during meiosis is that homologous maternal and paternal chromosomes got together during meiosis I and, and exchanged some segments of their chromosomes in a process known as crossing over. This is the way that nature mixes up the genes in the, in the production of gametes. Those homologous chromosomes segregate into individual gametes. Those gametes have to get together in a process known as fertilization to create a brand new cell, the gene combination of which has never existed before in nature. This is now a diploid zygote. That, dip, that diploid zygote will undergo mitosis, development, and into a new organism, in this case, a human being. Let's start with the male anatomy here. The male copulatory organ is the penis. Some of the things that you should be able to point out are the erectile tissue, that's the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum. The urethra on the inside, that's attached to the urinary bladder. It also delivers the semen during ejaculation. Down below is the scrotum, which is basically skin and some fat that houses the testes. The testes is this egg-shaped organ right here, and we'll explain in a moment how that functions. Behind the testes is the epididymis, and the tube from the epididymis is the vas deferens, and that connects eventually up and around here over the urinary bladder to the urethra. Now there are a couple of glands that are involved in here. First is the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle is right behind the urinary bladder, and that secretes what's known as seminal fluid. It's a yellowish, viscous alkaline fluid containing fructose, which is a sugar ascorbic acid, and prostaglandins. The prostaglandin is like a hormone that causes the relaxation of smooth muscle. From there, the vas deferens turns into the ejaculatory duct as it goes through the prostate gland. The prostate gland encircles the entire urethra just below or inferior to the bladder. It secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid containing citrate, enzymes, and prostate-specific antigen that enters the prost prosthetic urethra during ejaculation and helps to activate the sperm. Then we have the prosthetic urethra, or we'll just know it as the urethra here, that combines with the bulbal urethral gland. The small gland is inferior to the prostate and produces a thick, clear mucus prior to, do prior to ejaculation that neutralizes acidic urine in the urethra and also helps to neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina, protecting the sperm in that environment. Take a closer look at the testes. Over here we have a diagram of what would be the testes. Now think of the testes as a, a ball of curled up tubes called the seminiferous tubules. Seminiferous tubules is where sperm production takes place. All of these tubes connect together and eventually lead to the epididymis and the vas deferens. Now if we were to look closely at some of those cells inside the, the seminiferous tubules, we'd see how the sperm are actually maturing. Now normally males at puberty start to increase their testosterone production and that starts spermatogenesis. The early sperm cell starts off as a diploid cell deep in the tube deep in the walls of the seminiferous tubules. That diploid cell is called a spermatogonium. This larger yellow area called the Sertoli cell is a supporting cell. As the spermatogonium starts to develop, as it's stimulated by hormones from the pituitary, 
it turns into a spermatocyte. That spermatocyte will undergo meiosis and develop into four round spermatids. These are immature sperm cells. They're all haploid cells. That is, they have half the number of chromosomes than the body cells. Those spermatids will develop tails and be the mature sperm that eventually get released into the seminiferous tubules. And as they mature, they'll be stored in the epididymis awaiting ejaculation. The male hormonal control of gametogenesis starts up in the hypothalamus. You remember when we discussed the endocrine system that the hypothalamus secretes a hormone known as gonadotropin releasing hormone. That stimulates the anterior pituitary to secrete two hormones, LH and FSH. LH, or luteinizing hormones, stimulates certain cells of the testes called interstitial cells to create testosterone. The testosterone stimulates the secondary male characteristics such as larger muscle mass, bone mass, and increased metabolism. The FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, also stimulates the production of sperm in, in the seminiferous tubules. The female anatomy is this. In the pelvic cavity there are two ovaries. This is where the eggs develop. Those eggs started to, to develop when she was an embryo inside of her own mother. Extending away from each ovary is the fallopian tube, sometimes called the oviduct. When an egg is released or ovulated, the egg floats down into the fallopian tube and can make its way down to this organ, the uterus. Now, the uterus sometimes has a lining called the endometrial lining. The endometrial lining is a tissue that is specifically built up in order to receive a fertilized egg. And that endometrial lining would support a developing zygote into an embryo and then a fetus. Other features of the uterus is the cervix, which is a circular muscle at the opening of the uterus, and then the vagina. We'll have more detailed diagrams to look at in lab. Now here's a cross-section of the ovary and a little discussion of gametogenesis in females. These primordial follicle cells, as I said, are present when the female is an embryo. They just don't develop until she starts puberty. But at puberty, those primordial follicle cells turn into what are called primary follicles. By the time she starts ovulating, she's going to have well over 250,000 primary follicles in each of her ovaries. The ovarian cycle is a 28-day cycle that mirrors what's known as the menstrual cycle, which we'll talk about in a moment. But in the ovarian cycle, one egg from one of the ovaries is chosen to start development. And the egg changes from a primary follicle into an oocyte. The oocyte is the egg, but also what's developing with it are some supporting cells. These are called follicular cells. As hormones cause the follicle and the oocyte to develop, the follicular cells go through mitosis, causing the follicle to enlarge. And eventually, the hormones cause the ovum to ovulate, leaving behind some of the follicle cells. Those follicle cells will continue to develop on the surface of the ovary. Now, this isn't scar tissue. This is actually tissue that's going to start producing some hormone, while the egg and some supporting cells, called the corona radiata, make their way down the fallopian tube, awaiting fertilization. Here's how the ovarian and the menstrual, menstrual cycles work. The ovarian cycle is particular to the development of the, and ovulation of the ovary, whereas the menstrual cycle is particular to the development of the inner lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium. Again, gonadotropin-releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus, which stimulates the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. FSH and LH stimulate follicle growth and estrogen secretion by the, by the ovaries. Estrogen levels rise and feed back to the anterior pituitary, inhibiting the release while still stimulating production. That is, LH and FSH are still being made. They're just not going to be released for a while. So it's building up. As the estrogen levels peak about mid-cycle, around day 12 or 14, all of that LH and FSH surge into the body. Meanwhile, the oocyte's been developing. And this surge in LH and FSH caused the ovulation of the egg. Release of progesterone, estrogen, and inhibin from the corpus luteum 
then inhibits the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary so that another egg will not start developing and ovulate in, during this time. The corpus luteum will continue to do this for about seven or eight days after ovulation, at which point it will start to disintegrate. And now for the menstrual cycle, or sometimes known as the uterine cycle. The cyclic changes occur in the uterine endometrium in response to the ovarian hormones in the blood. In the menstrual phase is considered days one through five. The uterus sheds all but the deepest layer of the endometrium. Detached tissue and blood pass out through the vagina as the menstrual flow. The proliferative phase, as estrogen levels rise, the endometrium rebuilds itself in preparation for another fertilized egg if that were to happen. So these are the events after ovulation. Right here you see the egg being released, and this is about actual size, but then they blow it up here. Here's the oocyte with its supporting cells, the follicular cells. If sperm are to get here, fertilization will happen inside the fallopian tube. It could be on day zero, it could happen as, as late as, as day number five or six. After fertilization, it takes about two days for mitosis to start and cleavage of the egg. Each time mitosis occurs, the number of cells doubles. But the overall mass does not increase. The cells get smaller to a point. By the time the egg reaches the uterus, there's a ball of cells with an inner mass. That ball of cell is called a blastula with an inner cell mass that will eventually become the embryo. That blastocyst will then embed itself into the endometrial lining and the cells of the placenta will start to develop. Here's a short little video that describes it even better than I can. In this video then we'll look at the beginning of development looking into the ovary at an unfertilized egg. It then gets fertilized by sperm which travel down the fallopian tube. So here millions of sperm coming along. Several of them will hit the egg and try to penetrate it but one will win as it were, go into the nucleus and then there's a reprogramming process where the male and female nuclei have their genes uh, set aside to be turned on and off for early development. Here you see early cleavage stages occurring and this is one of the early growth phases. As the embryo moves down the fallopian tube, it's going to form an important stage called the blastocyst here in a few seconds. Of course, in real life that takes days, about five days. At this stage then I'd like to draw your attention to the inside of the blastocyst where there are cells called the inner cell mass which I'll be abbreviating as ICM. Those are the cells that make the entire animal and the outer cells give rise to the placenta and other supporting tissues. At this stage the embryo implants into the wall of the uterus. This is when a pregnancy is really initiated. And now we'll see those blue inner cell mass cells form a disc and then as the cells continue to grow, they change their physical positions, their kind of geographical relationship to one another. And you'll see that represented here as this disc gets transformed into an embryo. Those lines represent sites where cells are migrating in and out. And here's an important stage when the three beginning layers of the embryo, the so-called germ layers, are formed. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. As development proceeds, there's more growth and movement of cells. It'll begin to form a neural tube. Here it turns and appendages start to bud out. You see the head forming and the eye. And then eventually we get a small embryo. And some months later, of course, this would be born as a young baby. Here's the gastrula a little bit further along. These green cells here would be embedded into the endometrial lining of the uterus and will become the placenta and the umbilical cord, which will nourish the developing embryo through pregnancy. Now that intercellular mass now has three distinct layers. We've got an ectoderm, which will become the nervous tissue and the epidermis, an endoderm, which will become glands, and the mesoderm, which will form muscles, tissues of the kidneys, and the blood. Some cells will differentiate into germ cells. So these germ layers are, in a sense, stem cells. They're already programmed to become one of a number of different types of tissues in the body. 
As these cells differentiate, there are over 200 different types of cells that they'll become. Each of those 200 cells will fall into one of the four primary categories of tissues in the body. As you remember, we've already studied muscle tissue, nerve, connective tissue, and epithelial tissue. Well, that's it for your introduction into the human reproductive system. I hope that was helpful, and I answered any questions that you might have. And if you have any questions, please bring them back to class, and we'll see you then.